also known as the fun panel. Um, we don't need screens, we don't need projectors, we don't need multimedia, we just need talented people with really good points of view. But it's very nice that you chose to join the cool panel instead of the lame panel next door. And so if you want to find interesting ways to bring them over here, like maybe tweet about the fact that maybe we have like girls in bikinis on the stage or if somebody's going to win an iPad, that would be really appreciated because I'd love to have a bit of a larger crowd. But first things first, maybe we'll take a little picture to wish everybody good morning around the world from ArabNet. So I'll take a picture and you're all going to be famous and you're going to be on Twitter, which is awesome. But can everybody at ArabNet please say hello? Cool. All right. Well, let's get started, guys. I was, I was listening to a really interesting um, radio article the other day and they were talking about how consumers change habits and how you can track people's habits. And one of the really interesting things I learned about was about Target, the retailer in the US. They've become so good at predicting consumer behavior now that they actually know when women are pregnant quite often before women do. Because of the products that certain women buy when they're pregnant, almost instinctively, they can predict that the fact that they're pregnant and they can actually send them vouchers you know, around baby, baby goods and so on. And quite often it doesn't surprise even to the women. Um, there's a Chinese curse, um, which is quite relevant to, to one of our panelists today, which is um, may you live in interesting times. And I think that if for any of us who work in digital right now and for any of us who live and work here in the Middle East, there's probably never been a more interesting time to be here. Um, I think we've finally, finally reached that point in the Middle East where we don't have to convince people why digital matters anymore, um, which is really good news. But at the same time, what we still find is that marketers are still driven by whimsy. They're still driven by fads. They're still driven by QR codes, for God's sake. And so, you know, the real challenge is what are we doing in terms of being creative without letting the tools drive the message and let the message drive the tools? Um, and so we've become part of this very, very interesting time right now. And so, quite conveniently, I'd first like to introduce our first panelist, um, Wasim, who's from an agency called Interesting Times. Um, Wasim and a couple of his colleagues um, started an agency one and a half years ago, and they're one of the, the brightest stars in our agency world at the moment. They did very well at the, at the FED's Effectiveness Awards last year. They've done some great work for brands like, um, for, the, for the Lebanese brewery, for Courage is Contagious, um, and they're also the agency of record for Red Bull, and doing very, very interesting things. Um, Wael Hattar works with an agency called Core, and he specializes in branded content creation. And I think it's something that a lot of brands and a lot of people are interested in at the moment, in terms of moving the needle and moving more interest away from that. But Wasim, if I can just start with you. Sure. Um, as you might have noticed, that the new season of Mad Men has just started, and yeah. I think Mad Men's been very interesting in terms of letting people, you know, kind of, it, it gives people a very interesting perception of what advertising looks like, you know, the men sitting around dreaming about what consumers want, trying to find that insight. But the reality today is data and planning is becoming so much more of an important part of what we do. And so my, my question to you, Wasim, is where does data end and creativity begin? Are they mutually exclusive or do they both work together and live together? No, no, they, uh, hi, good to, hi everyone. Uh, no, they definitely work together, actually. Uh, if you uh, look at in the past, basically, there was, uh, before we had all uh, lots of them are still today. Uh, we, there was a lot of thinking, and most of the agencies had a planning department that were actually always trying to figure out an insight to you know, put it as part of the brief for the creative to hang on to something. You know, uh, and then the targeting well, it comes mainly part of the media strategy and the media planning uh, part. Uh, today, and actually, uh, we have been doing lots of different things and try to experiment in the last year and a half when we started interesting times. But uh, we really don't have such a linear process anymore because, uh, well, the creative basically they work on the, on the brand value. Let's say, for example, the Lebanese brew, which was Courage. Mm. So mainly that was the brand value, which was Courage. Uh, in terms of uh, insights and all of that, it come from you know, uh, the creatives as well from the planners. It's not really something where the planners go for a month and start researching and all of that stuff. We sit together, we have some insights uh, from Google Trends, from things like uh, mm -hmm. any uh, social monitoring tools. And then we present that to the creative and they uh, start thinking of the idea. And lots of times actually what's been happening to us where the idea comes first actually. And then we try to see, mm, that looks like a good idea. How can we actually get it through to the consumers, and then we do the planning uh, backwards somehow. Yeah, sure. 
Uh, and in terms of media planning, it's been uh, quite easy lately also with the contextual targeting where it's not really anymore, yeah, it's not that hard anymore. So it, it's working together, but it's not any more linear where actually the planning is done separately and then all of that is gone to creative and then creative to execution, etc. So now it's more flexible. Yeah. Actually, what's interesting with that is a lot of the social content that we do, oh, hello, Wahid. Uh, <laughs> social content that we do, uh, we can do mid-project mid listening. So all the listening tools are out there. You can, you can take the idea and start to refine it halfway through the project. So even, like you're saying, the, yeah. it's no longer to try to just sit and kind of scratch your head to create something. You can even keep modifying as you go on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's quite interesting for you. I mean, because you sit within a larger media agency who are really pushing data very hard at the moment, talking about, oh, I can have a million different combinations of my Yahoo banner to give the right ethnicity and the right gender to the right member of the audience. And, it's just quite interesting to see that, you know, wh where that's going to take us going forward. Um, one of the interesting things you know, we're seeing more and more of at the moment, I think, is this concept of how the tail is starting to wag the dog. Um, in the old days, digital was always the last thing that a brand thought about. You know, they did the TV and the radio and the blah, blah, blah. And then eventually, they say, oh, balaya shabab, we need a website for next week to go with our QVC. Whereas more and more today, we're seeing digital is actually the core of the idea and growing out from there. And I mean, while you've been producing a lot of branded content that began life on the web and made its way across to, to more traditional forms, haven't you? I mean, the, the, what we're seeing is the whole thing starts because there, it's uh, living within kind of Stockholm and Zenit, the whole Viva Q thing. Do these teams kind of push and train their clients bit by bit? Mm -hmm. But what happens after a while is that the reason we do get kind of freedom of, of, of play inside the digital, per, the digital world is that kind of the clients, okay, fine. They, they see it's important, but they also, can see how they don't have to spend the big TV budget on it. Yeah. So they let us experiment. So if, if, if the worst thing happens and, and the whole thing dies, it dips a few, like tens of thousands of dollars versus hundreds of thousands of dollars. But, but th that's also the whole thing is from that point about not spending a, a big TV budget uh, type of thing. Uh, lots of clients think today that when you're doing something for the web, content for the web, that it needs to be cheap. Uh, it's it's kind of like, okay, we're doing this for the web so we can have a not necessarily, but it's a, good stepping, it's a good stepping uh, stone. Yeah. I mean, for, for the ones who don't do the web, yes. It's a good, it's, it's for them, it's like, okay, let's try something out cheap, because we can. With, where in TV, we can. But then again, the ones, like like, well, like the, the Chevrolet projects that we do, or all kind of the bigger brands, they got used to it, so they now do give us a decent big budget. I mean, right now, it's a project that I can't talk about, but with Blackberry, we just locked a, a proper decent budget, which is very just digital. Yeah, but it, sh it should be something that's normal and standard. Actually, because uh, today even you have, I mean, when you're producing for TV, you don't even have, uh, you know, you're, it's like you're pushing the message. When you're producing for the web, it really needs to be quality content, might need to be a big production, etc., etc., as well. So it doesn't mean that if it's going to the web, that means I can do it cheaper, etc. And then that's trend going uh, going forward. Yes and no. Look, there's like that. There's, there's both. Huh? <laughs> I'm not agreeing, no. But tell us, um, Wasim, tell us, tell us about Red Bull and about your, your drift campaign with Abdul Khalil. Okay, uh, that was an interesting project actually because uh, Red Bull is actually good at branded content. If you look even at their, uh, their advertising, the traditional advertising that goes on TV, you're not allowed to do an ad for Red Bull. It needs to be the cartoon ad and it's global. You could customize it, you could adapt it to the region. And this is how it is. I mean, and why they actually went this way was like, they wanted uh, their advertising to be entertaining. And then they said, no market can create any ad, it needs to be a cartoonish ad, it needs to be entertaining, and then that's how it works. Now the flexibility from a Red Bull perspective comes when you're going on digital because you can create and produce content for Red Bull that's purely web, that's not coming from international. Mm. So, uh, so for car park drift, I don't know if you guys have seen the last year's Abdul Fale with someone, a Saudi guy and a girl, etc. It was quite a successful campaign. It was a very, very, very basic uh, concept where we had Abdul Fale with different characters and the, and the drifting car with the camera in front of them. And just what driving around like crazy. Driving around. I mean, that was that was a script. That was, it was all. It was not real actually. It was it was set up. But uh, nothing you see is real. <laughs> yeah, it, it was not real. Uh, so, uh, no, I mean, they, Red Bull did some, some real stuff, for example, on Times Square, where they actually really did it. So, uh, so, so actually, we just shot this. It was quite successful. They, we got like uh, 7 million views on YouTube. Uh, every
everyone is actually known Abdul Khali before he was actually Abdul Khali is the whole thing is for an event called Barbar Drift. And he became kind of famous just after that viral video. Even NBC came and took that content, put it in, uh, I don't know if you guys know Driven, the mm. show. So Driven was actually now with Abdul Fghali sitting with Red Bull branding and a star next to him. Red Bull didn't pay a penny for that, uh, for that uh, TV content. Mm. And it was all based on the content coming from, uh, from the web, mm. which was, it was a decent budget, not something uh, extravagant. But after that, Red Bull kind of got the point that yes, we can produce for the web, and we can even increase the budget to have high quality uh, content for the web, and that's what it is. It's entertaining. Yeah. What do you think, Wyatt? I mean, I mean, you imagine you're probably working with a lot of more traditional advertisers who are trying to dip their toe into this very interesting new space. What are, what are you doing with them? How are you talking to them about it? I mean, a lot of times it does have to kind of connect with what we earlier spoke about. They do need a bit of data, a bit of numbers for them to be able to develop. So in the sense of traditional way of working, we do aim to get a brief, at least so by the end of it, when someone's asking, why do I have a puppet or why do I have a music video? At least they know, because three months ago you asked for this. Mm. So in, in a way we have to kind of keep it there to guide them because of course with, sorry, with production, either loud or not loud, with, with production, um, you never know where it's going to end. Or like, similar to like a documentary, so you need to kind of um, make that kind of little yellow brick road happen. Well, measurement's quite an interesting one, isn't it? Because, I mean, we, we as a digital industry have spent the last 15 years kind of banging the drum to say, ROI, ROI, it's the most important thing. And the funny thing is today, almost we've almost conditioned marketing managers where you can talk to them about any medium, and they go, yeah, whatever, that sounds good. As soon as you say, I want to do something digital, they go, where is my ROI? You know, so, and it's a really hard one because, you know, at least you have things that can be measured, be they YouTube views, Facebook likes, Things like that. I mean, what, what's what's your take on all that? How are you measuring it, and does it actually make sense? And is it working right now? It, look, we, we, I even got a strange question. We were like, how many, how how do you cost out a view on YouTube? I'm like, uh, it's it's still an art, not a science, because a channel, a, ch a versus a channel, you can't put a dollar figure on one like. Mm. So yes, from that sense, we can't. But of course, from from the basic one, which at least from eyeball figures, you can say this one inter interacted. But it's. It goes back to the other way because digital is really now attached to the social media. Mm. You, can, you can hear what people are saying live. You, you can tell how, what they like and what they don't like. <laughs> well, see, you're folding your arms when you heard the word social media. No, no, no. <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts on ROI and, and how are you measuring you know, the effectiveness of your, of your client's investment? Uh, well, uh, we kind of we worked on two, uh, two uh, figures, time spent on site and then unique visitors in general. Now, uh, what, what's good about YouTube and the number of views, etc., it just shows you how interesting or how entertaining is, is the content. And when you're talking branded content, it's advertising and entertainment. So the, the challenge today is to get the clients to say, okay, uh, how interesting, how um, can the client stay on the side for a bit and get the agency, trust the agency to produce entertainment, and then also, yes, of course, include the brand and everything, and then. You, you get the figures from YouTube, etc., all of that stuff. But uh, one of the interesting things also for uh, YouTube is today when you have the different, you know, multiple views, a million, etc., uh, means that your content is, uh, is interesting for them. Mm. And, and that's why, you know, initially when uh, advertisers start putting their TV ads on YouTube, it didn't work, so they realize this is a different thing. Mm. Now, uh, but this also, since the, the panel is about the advertising platform, this also opened now, I think on the 9th or something, YouTube is launching uh, the pre-roll uh, videos. So, uh, in the region, of course, it's already launched in the US. So now, traditional advertisement can happily take the, the basic uh, TVC format, put it on a 30 second there, and force consumers to see it again. Yeah. So we're kind of shifting TV to, to YouTube same concept. Anyway. Well, that, that's the whole beauty of branded content, isn't it? And that, you know, consumers have more and more choice of where they get their content and their news and their entertainment from. They've, it's easier and easier for them to ignore your advertising and they're becoming yeah. more and more apathetic towards it. And so branded content becomes a great opportunity for you to be the, to be the, yeah. to be the content. I mean, that's what he's saying. You're talking about how, how long people stay on the site, how, how, how long, they, how, how, how many numbers you get on your page. For us, the interesting with the recent project for uh, Arab Idol with, with, with Chevrolet is that it wasn't the, the, the big numbers weren't from the NBC one or the Chevrolet page. It's actually the, the youth in Saudi who took it, put their own little logo on it, and put it on their channel as this is something that I like. 
So for us, once we hit like beyond million, with these kids who have bigger numbers. So it's so when you when you kind of do the whole ROI, is it people coming to my site seeing it, or someone ripping it from my site, putting it on theirs, and endorsing it themselves? Yeah. yeah. You know, and this is a fully branded one, so it's you know. Oh, but it's definitely also taking it uh, away. I mean, most of the websites like today's, let's say the Red Bull uh, portal, they have actually embedded portal where you can take any of the videos, put it on any of your sites, and it takes the views from. Uh, no, this one, they actually, side, so. they, they stole it and put their own yeah. name. Yeah, I mean, even the client was like, I want to make sure the high quality is with us. I'm like, this kid has HD from NBC. I don't know how he even got it. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, even before we put ours on, they just... Sure. Well, I'd, I'd just like to kind of say to the audience, if you have any questions you want to ask Wasim or Wael, stick them up on the Twitter wall, and we'll be very happy to ask them if you have any, anything you want, you want to poke them about or ask them about. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that I found really interesting was that I was at the, the Crystal Awards a month ago. I was at the Lynx two weeks ago. And two, two things really st stood out for me. One, almost all the real standout work, the real award winning campaigns came out of either Beirut or out of Egypt. And then similarly, almost all the real standout work was for nonprofits. Yeah. Um, there was almost nothing where you could actually point to a traditional consumer brand, the guys who typically have much more money, much more insight, much more data, and even the biggest ad agencies, their best work last year was for charities, for government <laughs> initiatives, and so on. Why is that? Why, why aren't we seeing more standout work for, for more traditional brands at the moment? Well, first of all, we were busy this year doing kind of developing some things, so come back next year. Okay. <laughs> but no, um, we were talking a bit, bit about this kind of earlier on. What I think it's because we don't have a client with specific marketing needs, they, they, ha they let the agency have the freedom to kind of do what they want. Yeah. Uh, and that's when you have that freedom, then you can really kind of develop and create. It, it's a shame that a lot of brands still feel kind of insecure about, about giving people their own. I mean, the, the reason your, your brewery one did well is yeah. the, 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 the client just said, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, we were, uh, with the Lebanese brew, for example, we had a deal with the client. We said, okay, we're the marketing department. We take the decisions uh, on what are we going to do with the, with the money. And then, hence, we took all the money and did whatever. We did the music clip. We put it all on Facebook, etc. When, uh, actually, in 2012, in Cannes, it's going to be the first year where they're going to be a category for mm -hmm. branded content, uh, which is interesting. But today, if you see, like, uh, most of the NGOs, and it was a surprise in the Dubai links that a lot of the NGOs also uh, did get some awards. In Cannes, usually, they're, they kind of, they get shortlisted, and et cetera, but they, they don't get mm -hmm. uh, too many big awards because the client is not really, you know, a demanding client. The agency can do whatever they want. They can come and say, this is what I want to do. I want to shoot this, and I'm doing that for free. You're not paying any creative fees, etc. Uh, uh, mm. Hence, you see really good work coming mm. from NGO clients yeah. and not from real clients who say, "No, I want to see the bottle. I want to have the mother doing this on <laughs> it." Et cetera. It's, it's a completely <laughs> different story. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> where, I mean, where, where's the opportunity there in terms of making that content relevant? Because so much, so much of it, like you said, is like there's an ad. You change the end frame, and you just put like a mother, you know, traditional Arabic mother there, and you've made your ad Middle East relevant. Where, where's the opportunity for relevancy right now in terms of connecting with consumers and connecting with youth, especially today, who are really quite cynical of this very manufactured advertising at the moment? I mean, it's similar to how we spoke about with, with the kids ripping the videos off and putting it on their own page on YouTube. The best example would be uh, the Jordanian online series, uh, Bet Bayaka, mm. that OSN just bought. Yeah. So, for, so for these people who... Sorry for Jordanian, I'm Jordanian. It's, it's, a, it's a land where creativity more or less goes to die. So for them to have that chance to go on digital saying, you know, I don't care about the, the big television or the local government station, we want to do what we want. They start doing that and, and people follow and view these ones, no matter if they're good production, bad production. You have some horribly produced uh, kind of two minute stuff that's from the, from the Saudi viewers that also getting two million hits for, for, kind of, for a couple of days. And that's because they have the, the, the leniency to do what they want and speak their mind. And kids now, or like even youth now, they don't necessarily have to listen to, to everything or even go on TV and, and wait for a show to happen. They want to mm. talk about it, you know, share it, and do everything that they want. So mm. being a digital platform, having no rules, and kind of uh, what be an anarchy of sorts mm -hmm. allows you to, to play. You yeah. want people to play. Yeah. I mean, I, what we're seeing as well at the moment is how things that were analog are becoming digital. And so everything you used to do in the real world mm. doing in the digital world, and everything that's digital is now becoming mobile. You know, and so more and more of people's time and their content and their attention is spent you know, on iPads, on iPhones, and things like that. Yeah. How do you think branded content needs to adapt to fit the smaller screens or the mobile screens? Uh, in terms of uh, mobile, uh, it's actually, I mean, 
there's there's some a uh, couple of insights that are interesting today if you want to do uh, SEMs and you choose search for example try it now if you guys have access to Google Trends search SEM and uh, today on mobile if you pick it's only a tick if you pick uh, mobile only is actually the cheapest uh, click through rate and uh, anything actually the cheapest in the whole region somehow it seems that all the media agencies are not using uh, search for mobile mm. it's a good opportunity guys if you yeah, might have still a month or two but uh, so I think advertisers are not really focusing on mobile uh, anymore and then also the, the in terms of the branded content you go to YouTube and you see it and this is quite from an experiential level because YouTube has managed to get that content through across mm. to uh, you know to your phone in a, in a nice format so mm. so you get to see it but when you go now there's a big debate also that we, we're having specifically on to go back on Red Bull uh, I hope they're not gonna hear this but uh, there there's a lot of stuff where they actually uh, websites are launching applications okay mobile applications they are really not that you know not that interesting so you know let's say that that specific website you're doing a, a, an app for it uh, it's a different type of browsing, a different type of experience. Mm. Uh, advertising on uh, on mobile also, it's kind of very, uh, you know, we have lots of companies coming saying we have a network of advertising. When is the last time you clicked on a, on a banner inside an app? I think my, my one-year-old daughter is the only one who did it while she was <laughs> clicking on the, uh, it's true, you, know, you, you don't really, uh, it's, it's still not perfected somehow, mm. unless it's content that's actually, uh, let's say, you know, that's, on YouTube and different things, mm. and, and, and it's, uh, well, it's, it's right. easily found on mobile. Yeah. But it's not. It's Look, I disagree from the beginning part of it. You, you said that branded content on mobile. We, don't, we barely have marketing on mobile, let alone branded content. Yeah. So it's kind of dip, difficult what you say. An entertaining bit that you watch uh, as a screen on mobile isn't a mobile specific design That's thing. Really so it's not a branded content for mobile. We haven't yet developed anything. Having maybe an app game or something that you do just on mobile, which is why it's more social media, that I can sell, yes, sure, yeah. branded content. I but we can't just well, stick that on everything. It's, see, we're, 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 we're talking aspect of it that maybe, maybe sure. makes it a okay. bit more. I mean, we're, we're talking about advertising. We had a question from the audience from May Abaza. You know, where, where are you, May? There's May. Um, May is asking about you know, what we're talking about you know, in terms of branded content. Are we, is what we're talking about right, really just taking, again, more one way advertising? And sticking it on the web, how are we making it more of a two-way conversation at the moment? That's, uh, branded content is interesting. I mean, if you go to Wikipedia today, what's what's branded content? It's it's actually a blurred line between advertising and uh, entertainment. Mm. So initially, it is entertainment. So it's not if it's not entertaining. I think we had a debate with yes. this over that before. If it's not entertaining, then it's not if it's not bra it's not branded content. Mm. So it needs to be entertaining, and then the brand needs to be part of it. We've done That's a lot of non-entertaining medical work yeah. for, for Panadol and all those guys. That wasn't entertaining. It was entertainment. But that's branded content because it's content that kind of gives you some information. I mean, the, the argument we yeah, have but, is but not having branded, a good ad that, ad that goes viral is not branded content. Or a, huh? No, no. Having a good ad that goes viral is not branded content. No, it's not, it's not about an ad going viral. Just because today on YouTube, if something is actually taken by people and seen by lots of people, then it's entertaining. It could be emotional, like the new Vodafone uh, ad. It could be funny, but that's a like the Red Bull. It's a commercial. No, it's it, not branded content. No, when you have two people that are sitting in a car, it's a commercial. It can be. It's, it's content at the end of the day. Yeah, content you know? is something. Branded content is something else. Yeah, but branded content is basically advertising, mixing advertising with entertainment. That's what it is. Now, at the end of the day, if it's an ad, I mean, how do you define an ad? Look, you define it by the media channel. That no, the an ad is something, sorry, it's a bit off topic, but we'll come back. An ad <laughs> is, is, is something that kind of brings uh, kind of some sort of awareness to the market, or to the yep. brand of something. Okay. Branded content brings an association. You want to see how it lives in the real world, not in a kind of marketing world. That's yes, branded, the main difference. Branded content is entertainment. That's what, that's what it is, and it includes a brand. So uh, that's that's what it is, I and mean, that's the definition of Wikipedia. That's not my definition. That's Wikipedia's definition of. Not everything content. on the internet is real, uh -huh. <laughs> but there's still like it's, real. It's, it is kind of in the middle. Well, on on that bombshell, um, I'd like to ask: <laughs> Does anybody have any questions from the audience they'd like to share? Any questions, Mr. McNabb? Oh, you, you've got a. You're loud enough. We can hear you. 
I don't think you answered the question at all, either of you, although I, I tend to a wild point of view. Branded or unbranded, what you're doing is pumping out one-way communication to the internet. Yeah. I'm interested to see if you're listening or you're just pumping. Oh, me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, of course you're listening. It's not, it's not about pumping content to the internet. Uh, and if we didn't answer the question, maybe. Uh, it's, it is a two-way conversation. And today, when you have, let's say, uh, uh, if we go back to the Red Bull example, this video out there, okay, that's uh, fun, engaging, etc. Now, how are people reacting to this? It's not about, uh, you know, people, yeah, they're going to have thousands of comments and stuff like this, but on top of it, when you go to the real life, at the end of the day, this whole content is made because of a specific event on the ground. And when you go on the ground, this guy became famous. He's now a Red Bull uh, athlete that has uh, much, a lot of brand equity. When he goes to the event, people interact with him. It's a, that's a two-way conversation. I mean, two-way conversation doesn't necessarily mean that I'm online and I have something where, uh, okay, that person needs to fill in something and then I have, it, it, it's, it's blurred today. So sometimes you just pump content online, but it's, you know, the, the, you interact with people offline. It's, it works like this. It doesn't have to be specifically about engaging with the, with the content. What, what about specifically engaging with the content? Online, comments. but this is how you do it. When you have a YouTube video, it's about the comments, about the conversations going under it. That's that's engagement. What we were talking about kind of at the beginning of it, where we said we use a lot of social listening tools so that we adapt whatever is happening. So whenever we do a, a social content project on, on a Facebook or anything else, halfway through, we can always shift to the topic they want to talk about, kind of amend where we are to kind of suit what people need. And then, yes, fine, a lot of it is kind of commenting on YouTube. Yeah. But to, to begin with, the I'm still doing the Chevrolet one, is that from the first part, we asked them which one they wanted to, to hear out of the three. So then when they picked the song they wanted, we did it for them. So it wasn't something that was made and then kind of pushed out. We were late to the last day to know what song it is and then kind of go on forward. So yes, we do. I mean, it's getting better especially with the whole social level of it. Any other questions for our panelists? Yes, sir. Oh, could you be, please introduce yourself as well? Uh, my name is Fadi. I'm from a social brand ah, consultancy sorry, yeah. called Netizency. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask, why don't we develop real-time branded content or real-time internet responses with a bit more creativity than text posts on Facebook? Something similar to what uh, White and Kennedy did with Old Spice, for example. Uh, live video creation, quick live coverage that exceeds the regular tweet or the text Facebook post. I think both of you are in full-fledged agencies that have enough manpower or resources who can actually do something like that. Is what's stopping you the client or the fear of having something like this not accepted or the cost of developing something of the sort? No, we actually did it for uh, Hiroshi and Osamu two years ago, uh, also for Chevrolet, where everything, we had little videos, pictures, it was a kind of a, a social soap opera, if you want. So th that, the project fit, the audience fit, so we did it for it. Sometimes you can't also force fit, oh yeah, we need to do this one, let's find any brand. No, no I totally agree. What I'm talking about is real-time video responses, as an example, no, or real-time photo those responses. Were. And I those think, were. I think, I think perhaps, I mean, I think, I think the opportunity is there. Yeah. I think it's maybe just the brief hasn't arrived that, that fits that yet, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But it's happening on the, on the, on the channel. Today, people are responding through videos on, on, on the different social channels that are existing. And it's, uh, you kind of have today also to understand when you're going to create something you know, that you will create, or when you will be using existing tools, and then get people to engage with those existing. It's much easier because today, uh, if someone is uploading a, a video on any, any platform, let's say Facebook or et cetera, it's much easier. It's directly integrated to the mobile, et cetera. When you're going to come and create something, you're going to have to have a mobile component to it, a web component to it, uh, integrated with YouTube, etc. Suddenly you figure out your budget is like $80,000, $100,000, like the client is like, what? Uh, so, you know. yeah, but also like you said, it, it's the brief, I mean, uh, in the end for us, if, uh, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> in the end for us, if, well, if the brief fits the need for the response. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 I had another idea, but uh, it went. So while you're mulling it over, um, <laughs> Can we have the next question from the audience? Man, it's a quiet bunch this morning. Um, oh, there's a question. Oh, May. May has a question. I remember. 
Are you remember what? Yeah. Can I, may, may I interrupt you? <laughs> yeah. Um, Fadi, as we were saying, a lot of the brands that we work with, unless it's a revolution or war, real time doesn't really fit into it. I mean, if it's a shampoo or a car, nothing is going to happen in 24 hours that's going to change that industry. That's why also, unless it's a specific project, you know, hair care and chocolate and, and everything else can survive. Exactly. True, but you're saying about videos and all things versus kind of note to note social handling rather than pure content development if it isn't specific. Nice. Uh, okay, I want to go back to the two-way conversation point for a second. Uh, what do you guys think about um, more user-generated content? Is the, is the problem uh, lack of willingness from the community to produce content that is related to brands or corporates, etc.? Or are there not enough creative ideas that encourage that kind of effort from uh, its consumers or audiences? Generated content is something that uh, I think is uh, kind of reached somehow its maturity. Two years ago, everyone was talking about yeah, user-generated content, and but today, user-generated content is gonna is gonna be low quality somehow. You know, it's a bit low quality, so it's either it needs to be uh, shocking, you know, for it to uh, to pick up like all the stuff that you're seeing now from the region, uh, in Syria, etc., the different type of content. But uh, in terms of uh, doing it for brands, they're, they're already doing it. But, but you see, today there's so, so much out here. In the region, there's a lot of user-generated content, but it's not all pushed to the masses, etc. It can be between small communities here and there, etc. I That's share it with my, with my family, with my etc. I share it with my friends, uh, etc. And now even with, with Facebook, lots of people, uh, especially also when it becomes a bit... A bit Things that are a bit personal, etc., are kind of narrowing down the, 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 the level of, uh, of spread of the content they generate because they don't want it to go anywhere. Except if they're intended, they intend for it to go everywhere, then, then it's, a, it's a different story. For once, I agree. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Hi, uh, Daniel Ranimi from CEO Lebanon. Um, my question is a bit uh, near futuristic. Um, it's about augmented reality and, uh, and advertising in the local market. Any plans? What is the strategy? Did you capitalize for that? Do you have the resources? That, I think, is great. Augmented reality is definitely picking up. I mean, uh, I'll get, you, get the answer after. Last year, we had a project where we pushed uh, an augmented reality project for, uh, for uh, Red Bull. Uh, it was expensive. Uh, the technology was not that great. Uh, I mean, now it's kind of commoditized. You have layer technology, Qualcomm, etc. We just launched an augmented. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can say that, but uh, we did something on, on, uh, on that front. It's really amazing how it works today. I don't know if you guys tried it, but I could be sitting here. I could put my mobile up to that screen. And it could automatically take and uh, identify the picture, the video, or even the real life. Takes it, put the content on top of it, and it really works. It works, it's easy, and it's becoming cheap. You could develop something really good for ten, fifteen thousand uh, dollars $15,000. There are a couple of people uh, that are really good at doing that. And you have different technologies. And I think next year, it's going to be all over the place in the region. Definitely. The gentleman in the back has a question. Yep. How are we doing for time? Please wrap it up. Hi, um, I'm Anthony from Blipper, augmented reality. Actually, my question is very different. Um, it's actually for you know interesting times coming ahead. Hey. <laughs> um, today, advertising it's very blurred in terms of uh, defining what it is. Before you had art direction, copywriting, you had some account. It was very, uh, you had three categories at can print, TV, radio. Today you have over 50 um, students today who wants to go into advertising, want to study. How would they choose how to go into a career and what kind of profile do you look for when someone is applying? That's it. That's me. Uh, both. What, what, oh. want to start? Advertising I, I, and media, I mean. What well, advice you want you someone branded content, someone who's very techy, someone who's a storyteller, a filmmaker? What do you look uh, for? The thing is, it's, advertising is a very different field to the brand content when we look for people. So it's, it's not 
uh, I, mean, I studied graphic design back in the day and worked in advertising and then moved forward. So with what we look for is that actual different selection. I want people who either are very creative in, in writing and coming up with ideas, but also some are people who marketing-wise can, can, can maneuver the media. So, I mean, if you're talking about ad pure advertising, then it's, it's just your drive. If you have that persona, that personality to, to, to live in, a, in an environment that kind of lives without you, that's what that fits in. So, I mean, the, the ones we hire are, everyone has a different background, nobody has one specific thing yeah. in content. But advertising is, I think, is still more. Uh, well, uh, since we started interesting times, you said, we don't want to stick to the traditional planning, etc. all of this. Uh, and we kind of try to find new roles. Let's say the client servicing is actually the planning uh, person. Now, uh, so we kind of try to see if, uh, what type of backgrounds fit in each of the departments. It doesn't really, uh, that was not really a standard uh, answer to, okay, that's the profile, this is what you need to do in university to come and uh, work in this type of department. We had a copywriter, we just hired someone who's not actually, he came, he was a copywriter, and then we figured out he was better at planning. The issue also we have is one of the partners in Interesting Times who's, uh, uh, who also uh, has, uh, he does the cotton uh, candy parties at night, so we have lots of weird people coming to the office applying for <laughs> jobs. So, uh, so we have from, from everywhere, it's just, you know, uh, it's, it's not really that, uh, that uh, linear anymore, it's just... Uh, I don't call them weird. I don't, you know, um, oh, box people one, like that. One last question. Yeah, don't work with us. One last question from the gentleman over there. Yes, sir. Thank you, Eli Bijani, Mobile Online. Uh, I would be interested to know a little bit in numbers what is the amount or percentage of uh, expenses on di on digital advertising compared to classical advertising, and uh, how much do you think it will become in three years? Give your forecast and. Uh, within the digital uh, arena, how much it would be web and how much it would be mobile? I'll, I'll answer that one. Just uh, guessing. Um, it's a very hard one to answer now because it's no longer about you know, creative versus media spend. I think today when you look at something like branded content, what is that? Is that media or is that creative? You know, and I think you know, realistically it's very hard to say because if you look at you know, digital as a percentage of media, yeah, maybe it's 5%, 10%, depending on whose numbers you believe and whose brand you're talking about. But I think yeah, US that, is 40, now 50. You know, exactly. But I think that line is becoming more and more blurred because today, if you're doing stuff on digital, well, you're producing creative, you're producing content, and you're buying media. And so I think what you're seeing is, obviously, there's a shift. You know, people are running towards, you know, towards that side of, of the room in terms of you know, the, the, the investment in, in, in yeah. marketing. But I think it's become harder and harder to say, oh, that was media and that was creative because, again, all those barriers are coming yeah, down. But there is a formula, though. Huh? Uh, there are lots of people. I mean, there's some lots of clients who have a formula. I mean, usually it's. Uh, I mean, it depends. But like five years ago, it used to be 20 percent of the marketing budget. So 10, 20 percent. Today, you could reach up to 40 percent in brands who are actively on digital. And then, mm -hmm. the the issue today also, if when you saying, okay, let's say that we have a budget of a million dollars, then we're going. Uh, we're you know from the total budget, 40 percent is going on digital. Then it goes on digital, and then how would you split that budget into production and then media? And then that's a different story because lots of times then it goes into production, we end up doing just banners, and then media is like 80% of the cost and 20% is on production, while it should be 60, 40, 60 media, 40 production. And lots of times even there's hardly any, uh, any budget for, for production, there's only budget for uh, online media, which doesn't make any sense. Well, because all right, well, well, thank you for that, guys. I think we've had some really good conversations, some really good ideas. Just Thanks. so that we can wrap up, um, well, what's the one thing that's got you really excited this year? What do you think the really hot thing we're going to be talking about at ArabNet 2013 is going to be? I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's the kind of the freedom of, of the, the actual people, the, if you want the user-generated ones, to, to start coming up. So when you're talking kind of the earlier question of how do we find people to hire, now that you no longer are blocked into something where you have to kind of cohere to what is pre-sold, I have now people coming up who are very creative, uh, being able to display everything on digital because it's a free market, and, and for them to, to get to a point where they can work properly high-end and then no longer spend enough but share. So it's about creative, the, 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 the creative revolution rather than the, just the fighting revolution. <laughs> Wasim, what's your, what's your hit prediction for the year? Uh, augmented reality, definitely something that's super interesting. 
we tried it, it really works, it's nice. Uh, I'm happy that in this ArabNet there was not a lot of talking about moving, shifting budgets to digital. We're <laughs> over that now. Yusuf has been, <laughs> you, you've, you've gone through that a lot as well. Uh, prediction for this year is I think advertisers are going to be more bold and going and generating entertainment content and innovation is actually Great. a key thing. So I think we've definitely got an interesting year ahead of us. So ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Thank you.